to stand together as we welcome the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch, like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. This is the Gospel of the Lord. speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, many of you will know that this is one of my favorite subjects, the subject of wine, which was a recent book uh, that I've, uh, it is going to be published, uh, hopefully in September or October, A Biblical Theology of Wine, so I couldn't resist when John 15 came up in the lectionary. I told Matthias he cannot preach, and he will not preach. <laughs> But this is my passage. Anyway, uh, in all of my research and my joy in discovering about wine and the Bible and the biblical text, I did um, some practical, uh, some practical kind of um, work out of my uh, out of my studies. And I planted last summer two vines. They were Chardonnay vines, um, and planted them in my garden. And thought, if I am going to write about wine, I need some experience about being a vintner. I need to grow my own, my own vines and ultimately, hopefully, to produce some grapes and make my own wine. But these are early days, and uh, it was the first year I planted them last summer. And I noticed that one of the vines was springing up uh, re really well, actually. It was doing, it was flourishing, it was kind of growing up. But the other vine was not doing so great. It's about midway through the summer, and I went over and looked at it, and upon closer inspection, I realized that one of the branches, which was the main branch that was shooting out, had just kind of broken off a little bit. So likely it was my children kicking a ball or doing something, and they broke my vine, which of course I was furious about, but I didn't say anything. Um, <clears throat> so I tried to kind of, you know, to, to, to kind of tape it, to hold it together with a little twist tie to see if the vine would graft back into the main the main root, the main stalk. Um, but as the summer went on, I realized it just wasn't really going to do anything. So I waited till the winter and then had to trim it, br trim it back. Now, any of you who are gardeners, or if you've ever, ever done any gardening, you'll know that for any plant or tree or vine, it will concentrate its energies into growing, into growing its life, into the branches and leaves and form new things. And so this is why plants need to be trimmed and pruned, because you don't want energy. You want to focus the energy of a plant or a tree or a vine into where it's going to produce. So, for example, if you have a vine, vines are 
are pretty um, interesting plants because if they have enough sun and water and they're very happy, they will just keep growing and growing, but they won't produce any grapes uh, because they need a little bit of stress in their life. They need to be cut back and they need to be trimmed because the moment that the vine is cut and some of its growth is cut, all of a sudden the vine is thinking, oh, wait a minute, um, life is not so good. I think I need to reproduce. And I need to reproduce myself through the seeds that come in its fruit, in the grapes. And so <clears throat> to, to have a good vine, you need to prune it back. You need to cut off the dead, uh, the dead branches so that the, the focus and the energy of the plant can, can be directed to, uh, to its fruit and to making the most concentrated grapes that you can produce. It's the same with fruit trees and other things as well. Now, when Jesus was speaking to this group of Israelites around him, most of them probably would have known exactly what he was talking about. Because most Israelites, if they had enough land, they would have a small patch in their land where they would grow their own grapes and their own vines, and they would produce their own wine. Most Israelite households would have enough wine for an entire year. And so they understood this idea of pruning back. They understood that a vine needed to be planted in good soil. They understood that to um, harvest and to produce the best grapes, that the vine needed to be tended to. It needed to be a bit stressed. All of these things that come with practical gardening skills. So most of the people around Jesus would have understood exactly what he was talking about. But then he says something slightly different than most normal gardeners. And this probably would have thrown those Israelites listening to him for a bit of a loop. Because he then says to them, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Abide in me, and you will bear much fruit. All of a sudden, maybe the people in the crowds were thinking, what is this guy on about? What is he talking about? But to fully grasp <clears throat> the sense of what Jesus is saying and to fully grasp the shock, maybe, that was being felt by those original listeners to Jesus' uh, metaphor here of being the vine and the branches, we need to go back into the Old Testament, into the scripture that testifies and that talks about Israel as the vine, as God's chosen vine. And we see this in the Psalms that God chose a, took a vine out of Israel and planted it in the land so that it would flourish. But the most important place we see this is in the prophet Isaiah. Now in, in Isaiah chapter 5, there is something called the Song of the Vineyard. And so whether it was a prophetic song or a poem, but it was a little parable that Isaiah had put together to remind the people who they were in relationship to God. And basically the parable is this, that there is a man who wants to produce great wine. And so what he does is he takes, he, he slaves and serves and, and he removes all the rocks from a field. He cultivates the soil. He builds up a wall around it. He buys the choicest vines, the, the very, very best vines, the most expensive you can get, plants, plants them in the ground. But then the vines produce sour or rotten grapes. And Isaiah says, Israel, you are the vine, and you are producing rotten grapes. God has done all this work to plant you in the greatest soil. He has given you every opportunity to grow in righteousness, in mercy, in justice, and love. And you have produced wickedness and evil. And the vineyard owner says, so I'll knock the wall down and I'll let the wild animals have it as the prophet predicts Babylonian exile. So when Jesus speaks about the vine, it is more than just an agricultural metaphor. He is himself saying, I am the embodiment of Israel. I am the true vine and you are the branches. To be abiding in him is to be planted in his nourishment, to be grafted onto the life that comes from the vine, which is absolutely necessary to produce fruit. But I, this morning I want to share something with you that's a slightly different interpretation or a slightly different way to read this passage. 
Okay, so I love both of the readings, but there is a possible alternative to what Jesus says as you translate it from the Greek. So we're used to the image of Christ as the vine and we are the branch coming out of the vine. And I think that's a wonderful metaphor. I love that. But there's another possible translation. So the word for vine and branch later on, probably when John was writing his gospel, was being used in other Jewish sources where the word vine was actually being used to describe a vineyard, okay? So the place where the vines are planted. And the word for branch was being used for vine, okay? So are you following with me? Track with me here. So rather than Jesus saying, I am the vine and you are the branches, there's a possibility in the Greek that it could be translated Jesus saying, I am the vineyard, or I am the soil, and you are the vines. Everybody get that? You have to nod your head. (laughs) Yes, you understand that. Okay, it's important to get this part. Okay, so Jesus is saying, potentially, and I think both metaphors work, but that I am the vineyard, I am the soil that the vine needs to be planted in. I am... Apart from me, you can do nothing. Because anybody who's a gardener knows that you can't have a plant that is not rooted deeply in the soil in order for it to grow. Right? You have to have soil. And so if Jesus is saying, I am the soil that you are planted in and abide in me, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? That if we are to have life, if we are to produce fruit in this world, that we need to be rooted in his soil that we need our our roots to go down deep into his nourishment. And out of that nourishment comes that life out of the vine. And And Jesus says, the Father is the vine dresser, and he then prunes away anything that is dead in us so that we can concentrate the energies of our life into producing fruit and the fruit of the kingdom. Jesus is the soil in which we are planted in. And if you know much about soil, you will know that it it is one of the most mysterious, most most amazing, miraculous kind of place of life and flourishing complexity that is beneath our feet where we walk. There's more and more studies that have been done recently on, um, on soil health and, and what they call soil density. Is the soil dense with organic matter? And why this is so important and why farmers are starting to realize why soil density is so important is because the density of the soil in its organic matter is necessarily tied to the density, the, the nutrition density or the nutrient density in the food that we eat. And there have been studies that have demonstrated over the last 50 years that especially in the U.S. and the U.K., but in other countries as well, is that the vegetables, the things that we eat that come from the earth actually have less nutrient density in them because the earth has been uh, polluted with herbicides, with pesticides, with agents that are trying to overfarm or overgrow or, or, or dis- depleting the soil as they go along. But for a vine... For a plant to survive, it needs to be in healthy, nutrient-dense soil. The vine needs to absorb the sunlight through the process of photosynthesis. It takes in carbons through its leaves. It takes that carbon and then brings it down into, through its roots, into the soil where the carbon is used by all these wonderful micro micro bacteria below, these microbes that then use the carbon to break down nutrients, to break down dead organic matter, to create life that then gets taken back up by the plant to then produce its fruit. I mean, it is absolutely a miracle that happens around us every single day. The result of a good vine being planted in nutrient-dense, rich soil is that it will ultimately produce good fruit. Now the question for us this morning is where do we find the roots of our lives planted? What resources are we tapping into in our lives that are helping us and giving us the nutrition to grow? Because Christ says, if you don't abide in me, 
you can do nothing. He's saying, if your roots are not planted in my soil, then you can't produce. Where are our roots in our lives? Are we spending too much time in social media? Are we spending too much time concerned about our jobs or our careers or other things that distract us? Are we overwhelmed with anxiety or stress, being consumed by uh, worries of the future, how we'll provide what will happen in our lives? Are we eating unhealthy diets that are literally not giving us the nutrients our bodies deserve? Where are our roots planted? Because our passage this morning reminds us that Christ is the vineyard. That he is the only soil in which we can sink our roots deep. And when we sink our roots deep through prayer, through silence, through meditation, through good works, through caring and loving for others, that's when we begin to produce good fruit. That's, as St. Paul talks about, the fruit of love, of joy, of peace, patience, kindness, goodness. All of those things become apparent in our lives when our roots are planted in the soil of Christ. When I was doing some of my research, I came across one of the early church fathers, Irenaeus. And I love this quote from him. He writes that a day day will come for those who follow Christ when we will be like clusters of grapes. And he said those grapes will produce thousands of liters of wine because they'll be so full of life and so full of God's richness. And he goes on to say this, and I quote, he says, Then Christians will say, Take me, I am a good cluster. Bless the Lord through me. And I love that idea of the Christian life being like the fruit of the vine. That when it is crushed, it produces wine for the the love and for the celebration of the world. That we are like those clusters saying to God, crush me, crush me and pour me out into this world as your son was poured out and brought this new wine into our lives. Jesus says to bear any fruit in this world, we must abide in him. We must abide in his love. This is the fruit that Christ promises to give us and it is the fruit that we then pour out to give life and joy to a dry and parched world. A vine has to be deeply rooted in the soil to grow. We have to be deeply rooted in Christ to grow. Where do we find our roots? Where do we find those life-giving sources in our life that are helping us to begin to produce that fruit of Christ's Spirit? How are we connected to the soil of Jesus Christ? So whether we look at our passage today as Jesus as the vine and us as the branches, or whether we look at it as Jesus as the soil, the fertile soil, and we as the vine, the message is the same. That we are rooted in Christ, that when we abide in him, he says, you will bear much fruit. And God will prune us, he will shape us so that we can concentrate that fruit and that fruit of his spirit in our lives. So ultimately we can bring life to the world. One of my favorite uh, things to do when when I've gone to Rome over the past few years, we do a college trip um, or a trip with our our ordinance and we do a a kind of little pilgrimage around Rome. But my favorite place is a church called San Clemente. And if you've ever been there, if you haven't been there, do, do go at some point in your life, you'll love it. Um, but if you haven't been there, one of the things about San Clemente is this is beautiful church that's like layers of Christian faith. So the, the, the history of the church is it goes back to a Roman senator named Clemens. 
And <clears throat> Paul mentions a Clement in uh, Philippians, and it's likely either Clemens or maybe his son or his servant. But he was a wealthy Roman senator, and he had a larger house, and so as many Romans did in that time who were more wealthy, is they hosted the church in their home. And so at the bottom of the current church, St. Clemens, or San Clemente, at the bottom is this first century Roman uh, ruin. So you can go all the way down and see the area where these early Christians would have gathered together worshiping the risen Lord. But then in the, th the, third, the fourth century, they built a basilica on top of it because it became a very um, precious site to the early Christians. And that basilica kind of fell, fell down and fell to ruins. And then on top of that is the current basilica, which was built in the 12th century. And now one of the things that's so special about St. Clemens is not only just the, the, the layers of soil, as it were, as you go up through the history of Christian faith, but as you walk into the, um, the, 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 the chapel, not the chapel, sorry, as you walk into the chancel and you look up, um, in many Roman churches, there's what's called a large asp, and, uh, apse, excuse me, apse, and it's a, a rounded kind of a half dome thing, usually with a mosaic. And this one has the mosaic of Christ as the vine, as a true vine, as the vine of life. And so there in this beautiful mosaic is Christ peacefully hanging on a cross. But at the bottom of the cross, you see all this greenery and this life emerging. And then from that greenery, you have these spirals of vines that are going throughout the entirety of the apse. And inside the vines, we see kind of shepherds and sheep, and, and, but we see the great doctors of the church and the prophets. And the idea is, is that all things are encompassed, all of history is grafted into this vine of Christ. And it's this beautiful image of how all things are summed up in Christ. All life is connected to Christ and to the cross. And it's in this wonderful image that I'll leave us with today that we are reminded of the invitation of Jesus saying to us, find your roots in me because apart from me, you can do nothing. So may we find our roots in Christ. May we abide in him. So that as St. Irenaeus says, that we too may be crushed, the fruit of our lives poured out as wine into a dry and parched world. Amen. stand and affirm our